it's a real pleasure to welcome Blair Palmer to today's episode. Uh, Blair is founder of That People Thing and also founder of the podcast A Brilliant Gamble. I've been really looking forward to having this conversation with you because I know that you really walk the walk when it comes to living who you truly want to be in the world. And I'm excited to talk more about what you've been up to recently. Um, But let's start off by sharing a little bit of your career history and how you got to where you are today. Can you give us a bit of a background from from your work at the BBC and and you became founder of that people thing? Um, Give us a bit of a background of how you got to where you are today. I trained as a journalist. After my degree, I went and and did a postgrad in broadcast journalism. And um, I'd always wanted to be a journalist. I I loved anything on TV that had to do with journalism and and being on TV or being on the radio or newspapers. Um, So I I started, um, after my my mission, I started in commercial radio and then I worked for the BBC. Um, And at a pretty young age, so 27, something like that, um, I became a producer on the Today programme on Radio 4, which was a bit of a shocker because I, having having wanted to be a judge for a very long time, I wasn't actually that interested in the news. Um, I liked the idea of it, but I wasn't that interested in the my shy of what was happening in Westminster or, you know, various conflicts around the world. Um, and so <laughs> I found working on the Today programme quite challenging, but also really exciting. So I did become extremely knowledgeable about what was going on at that time um, and um, and was a, a pretty good producer. I think I, you know, we, I broke a few good stories and... Um, didn't make a complete fool of myself every day Uh, but I did start feeling that it wasn't quite the right place for me Um, and I applied for a job on Women's Hour and then went and I got a job there and and then went to work at Women's Hour um, which suited me much better it was still my, my focus was still the news but it was much more about how things that were happening in the news and particularly in politics were affecting real people particularly women the implications of policies on the purse. Um, that was my kind of focus. And so it made the news very real, very applicable. And I liked that. But still, the you know, the hours are very long. The expectation is very high. There's a huge amount of competition for those jobs. So if you are not willing to be there at 8, 9, 10 o'clock at night, um, you know, having been there from eight in the morning, or if you're not willing to pull an all-nighter, or if you're not um, just willing to do absolutely anything that you are asked to do, then you're reminded very quickly that um, there's a queue of people outside the door that would willingly give their right arm to have the job that you have. So if you don't like it, then make room for somebody else. Mm-hmm. And um, in the end, I decided I would rather somebody else that job mm-hmm. um and uh, I could go and do something else. So that that's but and the something else was coaching. So I, I um, actually was reading the, the newspaper and um, as you do when you're a journalist. And I read about this new life coaching thing. This was like 1999, something like that. And um, thought, well, this will be a good good piece for Women's Hour. And we had um, a coach. I met a coach who then featured in this piece that we were doing. And I thought, oh, my gosh, that's I want to do what she does. I'd much rather do that than do what I do here um, at the BBC. And, and so that was the start of it. In 2000, I left the BBC and started my own coaching practice. And I remember you sharing a story with me a little while ago about how um, even when you were self-employed and doing all of the, that coaching work, you still used to run down the road when you had to post a letter and sort of, practically run back to your desk even though you didn't have a boss or you know you were on your own time but you still felt that pressure to not be away from your desk and you know to not be really productive 
every sort of second and every minute of the day. What was life like for you during that time? And, and you know, what, what was your lifestyle like? Yeah, I, I mean, that's right. We, <laughs> I remember that so clearly, that experience. Um, because I did realise as I was doing the sort of, I wasn't quite running, I was doing the sort of half run, half walk <laughs> thing where you're sort of slightly hobbling up the street. Um, I remember thinking as I'm doing this fast walk, no one is waiting for me back at the office. It doesn't matter if this takes me three minutes to post this letter or two hours. Posting the letter is one of the things I have to do today. Why am I why am I racing? And I, I made this conscious effort to really, really slow down my walking. But you know, the, the thing is that I still, I mean, this is now 18 years I've been running my own business. I still have, I'm still carrying some of this um, societal expectation mixed up with my own baggage. Um, around what a good day's work looks like and how you should work. And, you know, you should sit at a desk and you should um, start by nine o'clock in the morning and you should be finished by six and you should definitely not do any work at the weekend um, because that's bad. Um, so, and, and a million other constraints that mm. some come from me or come from the world. Um, about how you should and shouldn't work and and that was only that was only one of them so I'm still unpicking plenty of those um, even even after 18 years and I mean your lifestyle nowadays is is pretty different Um, and an example of that is the fact that we picked up this call today at 11 a.m not 10 a.m or 9 a.m or 8 a.m you know we got going at 11 a.m because I know that nowadays you live very much like me which is you know going to bed when you're tired and not setting an alarm to wake up and sort of feeling a bit more free to get the the sleep that you need and starting your day in the way that you want to start your day so what why did you make that change was there a moment where you thought, where, where you realised, gosh, why am I living this crazy, hectic lifestyle? Or did it sort of slowly emerge that actually you want to be living life in a bit of a different way? Probably a combination of both, but I do remember a a moment of realisation. So two or three years ago, I started really consciously working on being more present um, I have a daughter now at the time she was six or seven, something like that. And um, she was starting to get annoyed that I had my phone in my hand and I wasn't always um, present for her. And um, and I also was thinking, you know, I'm going to miss all this. It, it's all going to happen very, very quickly and I won't have been present mm. for it. Um, plus, I... I have worried a lot about money. I think there's something about when you run your own business... Not everyone's like this, of course, but you, for me, there was always this thing of, I have money now because the business is doing well now, but will it be doing well in six months' time? Or the opposite, I've had money had money last year, it was a great year, but this year it's really quiet, what's going to happen, am, am I going to survive? Mm. Um, now, of course, the evidence was I survived because here I still am after 18 years, but still, it, it was a kind of constant gnawing in my brain. Mm. And I realised a few things. I realised that the money uh, fears were really about the future. So they were about um, not do I have enough money today because, I mean, you, you can always cut your, your, your costs and, um, you know, you can always downshift where you live and things if you need to. And you can ask your parent, or certainly I can ask my parents to help me temporarily as well. Um, but it was more about, oh, I don't want to, I need to make sure that I'm rich when I'm old <laughs> because who wants to be poor when they're old? And so I noticed that. A lot of the projects I said yes to and a lot of the work ethic was about I need to make sacrifices today um, in order to have money in the future. Mm. And so I noticed that observation, that that realisation. I noticed the thing that I wasn't present for my daughter and I started really doing lots and lots of work, lots of meditation, lots of techniques to be in the present. 
And the more I got myself into the present, the more I thought, hmm, I don't really like it. <laughs> I don't like the present. <laughs> it, it's, it's tolerable mm -hmm. if this is a price that I have to pay for some future benefit. But if I'm going to get let go of the future benefit thing, then this isn't tolerable. There's no reason to do it like this. Mm -hmm. If all I have to do is to pay our overheads now and save a bit for the future, um, and I don't have to worry about my old age, then I should really enjoy what I'm doing. So I started taking different kinds of work. I stopped traveling so much for work. Um, I started spending more time just with my daughter and kind of consciously dedicating time and space to her. That has evolved over the last three years to something that is almost unacceptable now mm. um, um, to the kind of very traditional wake up in the morning, get the kid off to school, sit down, work very, very hard until the kid comes home, try to ignore her for another hour or two because I still haven't finished and then eventually catch up with her and it's dead and, you know, then find a bit of time to myself. That was my life and it felt really really mundane really boring and not making the most of this opportunity which is i work for myself yeah. why do, why do i have to work the way that you work when you work in corporate and so why was that so difficult do you think what what challenges did you face when you realized well hang on a minute i'm not working for anyone else now i'm not facing that competition and pressure that you had when you were a journalist that if I don't work till 9 p.m someone else is going to take my job and I'm going to be reminded of that fact so you know when when you realize that you don't have to work in that way was it was that difficult to 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 then change what you were doing yes it, I think it is difficult as you were talking, I was I was noticing which emotions were coming up for me, and they were guilt and fear. So the fear is that, am I deluded? I mean, people have been working hard and and being successful as a result of their hard work for hundreds of years. Who am I to say, oh, the hard work thing is a myth? It's not about working hard. It's not even about the cliche of working smart. It's actually about something much more to do with energy and attraction and manifestation and stuff that's very weird and, uh, and very hard to articulate. So that fear is very real. So that's, that's the first thing that comes up with this thing as guilt, which is I'm sitting around with my daughter at 11 o'clock in the morning watching... Um, reruns of uh, of call the midwife and gilmore girls and surely i should be working i mean everyone else is working surely i should be working mm. and 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 this feeling of guilt and this feeling of it's not fair it's not right who am i to have this kind of lifestyle so both things play, play a really big part and you you have to um you have to be constantly unpicking them and noticing what's triggering them and then and then do some more and work out where they come from because you know the the working my butt off thing was inconsistently successful anyway yeah. <laughs> so you know but i'm sure it wasn't because i worked hard that i had good years because i also worked really hard when i had bad years so mm. that that can't be the the key to success it just can't be so Tell us a little bit more about how you work now. My understanding is that you've been quite motivated by the unschooling um, methodologies. Um, tell us a little bit more about unschooling and how it's influenced the way that you work now. Unschooling is basically where you, anything that looks like teaching, anything that looks like educating, you don't do. <laughs> you allow uh, you create a rich environment for learning around the child and then you watch what they're interested in and you go with them and you support you facilitate um and, and how they learn so if she doesn't like worksheets you know, workbooks you don't do worksheets and workbooks if she gets most of her uh, um, information from uh from youtube you support her in finding really cool stuff on youtube um, and you don't try to structure it for for the child. So so that's unschooling. 
So I, I started thinking, well, if you can I apply the same approach to work? Anything that looks like work, I don't do, or I don't do it in that way. Um, now, of course, there are things that I do that look like work. I mean, I'm sitting at a desk at the moment in front of a laptop talking to you. Um, and I answer emails and, and sort of the normal things. But the, the stuff that that makes it, for me, unwork, what, what, so I've stolen the unschooling concept and now I'm calling this unworking, is, is stripping back as many of the constraints as I possibly can that are imposed from outside. Um, so that's to do with working hours, working location, um, you're just as likely to find me doing some work in my bed with my laptop because that feels less like work than sitting at my desk. Um, I may work in the, uh, in the evenings or weekends and not in the day. I don't count hours at all. I can't tell you whether I, I, I certainly don't do an eight hour day, but I can't tell you how many hours I do do because I'm just not keeping track of it like that. Um, and much more of a, much less structure. So obviously, if you um, need to speak to somebody, then you schedule a time. That makes sense. And so today I had a nine o'clock phone call with somebody and I was up and ready for that nine o'clock phone call. Um, but, uh, but then what happened after that was much more flowy. It was about looking at my desk and looking around and connecting with myself and thinking what's the right thing to do now. And actually the right thing was to sit with my daughter while she had a bath and have a chat with her not to carry on working um, until it was time for you and I to talk. So how does life feel for you now? I mean, there's some pretty enormous changes, taking your daughter out of school last year, completely changing the construct of your what your working life looks like. How is that feeling? Like, what, what, what is it like? Oh, I wish I could say to you, oh, it's amazing. I just, I feel transformed by the experience and so filled with joy every moment. Um, it doesn't really feel like that. It, it, it's kind of hard to appreciate it, actually. Um, one of the things that, that I know about change is having made lots and lots of changes in my life in the past is that it takes about six months for any change that you make to kind of normalize. Mm. And I'm not through six months. Um, so at the moment, it feels very conscious. It feels very intentional. Um, I, when I'm sitting there with my daughter and she's having her bath, I'm thinking, oh, I could be at my desk pushing through a load of paperwork right now or doing my expenses. Um, and then I use my my self-awareness and the skills that I've developed to go, you know what, this is what we're doing right now. This is, this is why we have the lifestyle we have so that she can have a bath at 10 o'clock on a Wednesday morning and I can sit with her and chat with her about it, you mm -hmm. know, about whatever she wants to talk about. That's why we're doing it. So it, it's a conscious uh, uh, moving aside of thoughts that come into my head around guilt and fear um, and consciously bringing myself back into the present and, and staying connected with the bigger why of, of, of why we're doing all of this. Um, so it's, it's not easy yet. But, but there are a few things that I've noticed that are brilliant. Not normally waking up with an alarm. I feel much more rested. Um, I love our evenings because I know I don't have to wake up very early in the morning. Um, and the other thing that I'm really enjoying and that I'm really, I have no no need to go back on is the sheer number of hours. I mean, I I definitely could feel like eight or nine or 10 hours a day, but I don't think I have it in me anymore to work <laughs> like that. Having experienced a two, three hour work day, I just don't think I could consistently go back to those long hours. I'm, I'm sort of broken. Mm. <laughs> and I, I was doing fine. I was, I was, um, I was powering through those days without much trouble at all, but I don't think I'd be able to do it now. I think when you, when you, when you um, break the spell, then you can't go back. You can't go back. And that is, that's a lovely thing. 
you've mentioned a few different times um you know that it started particularly two or three years ago this sort of feeling of being much more present um you've mentioned having a bit of a meditation practice and it sounds to me like these practices have been really fundamental to the changes that you've made to your life and and your lifestyle do you have any particular routines that you follow is it is it just a sort of a general part of your day to day um or have you had to put any discipline around that because it it also sounds like the challenges that you've been facing um in and having made all those changes that the part of the solution to those challenges is coming back to the present again how do you achieve that so there are things that i do and um sort of abilities that I have developed or that I am developing that I draw on inconsistently because part of this is about not having routine and if I said to myself oh I must every day do these three things um, as part of my unworking practice then I think those would become shoulds as well and those would feel constraining too so uh, I'm not a bit I don't really like routines I'm not good at you know when you have to take a course of pills I'm not very good at that I don't, I don't like doing something consistently every day um just because I've been told to so I, I, I'm not very good at that but there are definitely some some things that I draw on so the meditation I wouldn't say that I'm a highly skilled meditator um but I do quite frequently Uh, So four or five times a week, I would say, do some kind of meditation, whether it's an app or whether it's some breathing um, or whether it's just um, a sort of um, walking meditation. So really noticing what's going on around me and being very conscious. I'm taking a step. I'm taking a breath, that kind of thing. So um, I will do that quite frequently. Um, I use... um, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, the work of Byron Katie, but her four questions um, that that she developed, that she calls the work, um, and there are worksheets you can find on her website that that take you through the process, but I find that very useful. I don't often sit down and do the whole process, but her first question is, is it true? So when you have a, a thought that is causing you suffering, your very first question to yourself is is this thought true and sometimes just asking myself that one question in the moment is enough to dissipate the fear and the guilt that are getting in the way of me being in the moment Mm. so that's very useful Um, I've started doing a a morning routine which is about uh, just filling the first 90 minutes or more um, of the morning with joyful stuff um i don't wake up feeling terribly joyful and it does get me uh, take me a while to get into it but you know waking up and very first thing having a cup of tea out of my favorite mug in my bed um doing uh, doing some meditation looking on pinterest just allowing myself to to enjoy a half an hour of indulgence on on Pinterest or Instagram or something. Um, And this is all before my daughter wakes up in the morning. Uh, I find those things, uh, they they make me look forward to waking up in the morning. And at the very least, even if we do end up having an argument or the day is stressful for some reason and I kind of lose my way, um, I had that 90 minutes in the morning and... and, uh, and that's really special. So there are some things that I do and there are some things that I am learning to do to deepen my my ability to really, really be present. So given everything that you've done throughout your life and career, all the lessons that you've learned along the way, is there anything that you would say to your younger self? Any particular messages that you would give? Oh, so many, so many. And I hope that they are the messages I'm giving to my daughter, although she finds it quite annoying. If I was my younger self and and not my slightly tween age daughter, um, I hope that one of the things that I would 
want her to understand is that in the end, what really matters? You know, it, does it matter what other people think of your choices? Does it matter that other people are impressed? Does it matter that other people find the choices that you're making easy on them? Um, does it matter whether the choices are lucrative um, or high profile? Um, and of course, the answer is no, it really, really doesn't matter. So then what does matter is knowing yourself and knowing what will bring you as much happiness, um, peace, freedom as you desire. And, and that would lead to some very, very different choices. You know, if we, if we think about, I was very happy in my, uh, in my broadcasting career until I went to the Today Programme. Why did I go to the Today Programme? Because it was the Today Programme. <laughs> because everybody said, you, you could get this. You could do this. This is, this is what you trained for. This is, you, this is what you should be doing. And I was like, oh, yeah, I'll be at the Today Programme. And I'll be able to tell everyone that I work there. And it will be, my parents will be so proud. And they never thought that I was going to make it in journalism. And this will prove to them that it was the right thing, you know, to do. And the, all the wrong reasons. And I was, I was completely unsuited to that, to that job and to that environment. I did it for all the wrong reasons. And I was very, very unhappy as a result. Um, so I wish I, I wish I understood that then. If I had understood that then, I wouldn't be having to do quite so much unpicking now. So it would also be making my life now quite a lot, quite a lot easier. Having said that, having said that, I think one of the reasons that I'm able to do the work that I do now that I love so much is because of my own experiences. So if I had um, known then what I know now, um, I, I wouldn't, maybe I wouldn't have quite so much to share with people. So I, I, I'm not, um, I don't resent those experiences with the benefit of hindsight. But yeah, I think a lot of unhappiness and a lot of shoulds and a lot of obligation and a lot of sacrificing my own sense of well-being and inner peace for something that never really mattered to me. Um, and um, in some ways, you know, I, I wish I had, in some ways I wish I had those years back. In some ways I feel like I'm only just starting my, my real calling now. Mm. Um, Do you think you are now living a life the kind of way that your younger self would have designed it no is that i don't think that that's what she would have designed but i think that that's because she was really hung up on what other people thought and impressing other people and proving something to herself and to other people about her worth whereas actually now i really couldn't care less um what people think i i mean if they find it exciting and fun and they want to follow me on Instagram, then go ahead, I'd be delighted. But I'm not doing it for any of those reasons. I think I've, I've all but let go of the need to, to have status and to impress other people with my choices. And that's very liberating. And so is there anything that you think your younger self would say to you now? Any messages that she would have for you? Mm. Oh, that's really um, I think if she understood, one of the things I was very worried about when I was little uh, and when I was younger, when I was in, in my twenties was, I was very worried about how it was all going to turn out. Um, and I worried that my success was fleeting and that it was all going to go horribly wrong. Um, I think that, I think that she would be reassured that it all worked out great and I think that she would tell me that she would say that it was very reassuring <laughs> to know that I did end up having a successful business and a business that that really fit that really integrated with my life I think I think she would be delighted 
at that. I don't think she'd understand why it looked the way it did um, exactly. But no, I, I think I think that she would be be very reassured. Certainly, if I had known then that it was all going to work out fine, it would have taken a lot of pressure off me. I think I think we spend a lot of time thinking about how's it going to work out, how's it going to work out, rather than just being in the moment. And I'm not sure that trying to anticipate how things are going to work out is a very useful way to spend your time. Oh, I always get a little flutter of nerves at the point at which we're starting. It's crazy, isn't it? So I will just pause for a couple of seconds and then we'll get started. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was singing along. Have you seen The Greatest Showman yet? No, not yet. It's I'd love to see it's brilliant. You have to see it and you have to take Ivy. It's brilliant. Uh, I listen to the soundtrack at least once a day. <laughs> so I played a bit of that just to sing along, just to try and warm my voice up. This is what I know. That was fun. It's like more exciting for me to meditate because of the crazy experiences I'm having. this um, societal expectation mixed up with my own baggage um, around what a good day's work looks like and how you should work. Gosh, why aren't my questions coming out today? <laughs> 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 to think so hard about this you you could get this you could do this this is this is what you trained for this is you this is what you should be doing and i was like oh yeah I really, really enjoyed that. You asked some very challenging questions. It really got me thinking. Thank you. You know, I grew up on a farm and my parents were both pretty hippie-ish and I just didn't want to be like that. I wanted to live in the city and have the high life and dress nicely and never have to on my shoes ever again. <laughs> uh, I realised recently that I'm a lot like my mum, but my mum, um, on her bad days. Oh, no. 